for a moment in time, all of us, doesn't matter what our age is, doesn't matter that I'm in my 50s and I don't, I, I presume that you gentlemen are in your 30s, okay? Or, or late 20s. Oh, easy now. I know I'm receding. I got a, I've got some grays coming up. I'm holding on to 29 as long as I can. Okay, well, I said late 20s. <laughs> yeah. And just like that, we are back again with the Mind the Growth podcast. As always, I am Chris Kinghorn. And I'm Eric Hoffman. All right, Eric, we have some very exciting guests today. We are joined by the real estate guru, Andrew Donner, and his partner and principal, Mike Moriarty. His, his protege. His, his protege. <laughs> well, guys, thanks for joining. We appreciate you taking the time. Um, Andrew, if, if, we, uh, if we could start with you, do you mind giving us a little bit of context of who you are for the listeners who might not be familiar? Maybe kind of a quick summary of your, your career and kind of how, how you got to where you're at now? Sure. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a dad and a husband first, so I have uh, four kids, live between uh, Del Mar and Las Vegas. But my career, you know, I started in the Bay Area is where I was born and raised, um, went to the University of Colorado, um, followed a, a girl from high school I was interested in. Um, nothing special in regards to the specificity of my major. I, I ended up just kind of getting a general education, but it it so happened to be kind of the foundation to what I, you know, attribute to um, one of the strengths is that uh, I became a communication major. And from that, I, you know, now fast forwarding 30 years, you realize that how important communication is, you know, what you say and who you say it to and when you say it and, and different contexts. And so it's really interesting that, you know, I fell into that major and it ended up becoming so important in my life. But from the University of Colorado, um, my first kind of job out of college became doing mortgages. And I worked for a subsidiary of the paper lumber company, Weyerhaeuser Paper Lumber, got into the mortgage business um, when I was you know, 22, 23 years old and started doing home loans and you know, had some success um, in, in, that, in that market when, when I was doing it and ended up building a pretty big pipeline and portfolio but was never, you know, fully satisfied. I came from a mother and a father that both had small businesses, both entrepreneurial in spirit. So I was always looking and, you know, I did mortgages for a while and then I left uh, mortgages and made a passive investment into, uh, into a bar in Las Vegas that had slot machines and got into the video poker business, ended up building a chain of those uh, they're called taverns in the state of Nevada. And from there, kind of the natural gravitation is that when you've got a chain of these taverns and, you know, went from one to two to three to six to eight, um, wanted to get in the casino business. And um, I was fortunate enough that in um, 2002, I took, you know, we took over the gaming operations for in, uh, Las Vegas Hotel Casino called the Lady Luck Hotel uh, Casino. And in 2005, I was fortunate enough to be able to buy the real estate um, of the um, hotel casino. And by Vegas standards, you know, it was a small hotel, right? It was 750 rooms, 30,000 square foot gaming space, 1,300 positions, I don't know, 13, 1,400 employees. And sounds good in size, but it's actually smaller on the scale for Las Vegas. And so we did that, but then, you know, it, and um, went out and did a bond offering on wall street, which was super interesting. Um, you know, speaking at the 21 club, uh, and it, the only reason why that's well of relevant is, you know, I was a fan of the movie wall street when I was a kid and, you know, seeing them at the 21 club and here I am speaking at the 21 club where I had no business, you know, doing a, a bond offering, but here I was doing it and flying around, you know, on jets with, uh, Lehman brothers and CIBC. And then at the end of the bond offering, uh, it, it you know, totally went to, 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 to crap, I guess, didn't take the capital. And then, you know, the markets started to kind of crumble and implode. And, I mean, we came back and put together a financing package, but as you know, in 2007, in 07, early 08, it started to become a uh, challenge in the marketplace. Nevertheless, in uh, May of 07, I was able to sell a majority interest in the hotel casino to a large private equity fund called CIM in Hollywood. And, you know, kind of bounced along with them as their licensee and manager of the project for 0809, got introduced uh, 
by a mutual friend to a gentleman that was looking downtown for uh, potentially a new corporate office building and met the guy, hadn't really heard of his company before. It turned out to be the CEO of a company by the name of Zappos, a wholly owned subsidiary of Amazon. And the gentleman I was meeting with was the, the CEO, Tony Shea. And the only reason I had ever known that company is because I used to see boxes of uh, shoes for my children that my wife would order at the house. And then I came home and I was like, I met this guy, Tony Shea, Zappos. Oh, I love Zappos. You know, I buy the kids shoes. So that set off an incredible journey. And I was, uh, we were able to buy a City Hall of Las Vegas and bought City Hall of Las Vegas, created a corporate campus um, for Zappos and uh, signed a long-term lease. And as a result of that, uh, developed a personal relationship with Tony and ended up kind of being involved in running a private uh, equity fund of Tony's capital or, you know, and some other uh, close friends capital and ended up, uh, we did, uh, you know, four or 500 million bucks, a couple, you know, $250 million into real estate. I think we did a hundred and something transactions of which we did it all in those transactions were, you know, hundreds of thousands of square feet of commercial, hundreds of thousands of square feet of retail, uh, thousands of apartments, two hotel casinos. And we assembled, you know, plus or minus 60 acres, which I think is the largest kind of cohesive development uh, or assemblage in a, in a downtown. And then we did a series of partnerships, right? So there was uh, one fund was a $50 million small business fund where um, you want to open a sushi restaurant. And so we would become your partner. Uh, there was community and arts fund um, with th things of like festivals, like the life is beautiful festival. Um, and then there was a, a $50 million tech fund broken into five, different $10 million funds. And from there, it just kind of created all these rivers and, and type of things. And then in um, two, th you know, I did that for five or six years with Tony, was still running my company, doing transactions in between, investing on the side. And then in kind of 2017, it had run its course. We'd have deployed the capital. And I kind of went back to just kind of in my own world and started, uh, I took some time off. In 17 and 18, spent some time with my children and my wife, and and then in you know, started to re-engage again in 19. And you know, I've got a a, a nephew who's young and competent and aggressive, um, was in the institutional world. Um, you know, had started with a mechanical engineering background, and then you know, obviously moved into real estate and moved into multifamily, and then moved over into industrial platform. Who also had a kind of a desire to go out on his own and, you know, entrepreneurial spirit. And I was 25 years his senior and, 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 you know, was fortunate enough to make a few bucks and be in a position that said, you know, I have both the time and, and, and the capital, let's, let's go do something together. And, and, you know, the, the, the baby of form was, uh, of, uh, I mean, ardor was created and, and here we are. And that's, that, that's kind of the story. That's a good, Lots full circle. Go I like that. <laughs> I know I, I've got so many questions ready to dive in. <laughs> So Sorry for the ramble, but uh, there it no, is. No, no, it's great context. I, I think yeah. it's, it's a great story too. So Andrew, uh, the first question I have, because I, I, I see this often in entrepreneurs, would you say that because your parents had that entrepreneurial spirit that that kind of guided your way into that arena of business? Do you think if you didn't have parents in, that were entrepreneurs, would you have gone off on your own or would you have just uh, made your way through the corporate world? You know, it's, I don't, the answer to your question is I don't know. I think, one of, I think the biggest thing is, is as a kid, you know, I was the kid that had the paper route. I mm. had the job in high school. I was always interested in, in making money. I certainly think that helps because it's kind of front and center. You know, right. mom's going to her place, dad's going to his place. You know, they're pushing, hey, got to have this job, got to have this paper route. So I think it's all of those things that kind of a, a grab bag that get thrown into the blender and kind of gets put into your DNA. But, you know, look, I have siblings that came out of the same household, right? And those siblings uh, aren't entrepreneurial and have worked for other folks and you know, I've had successful careers, but completely different. Interesting. Andrew, one of the things that I'm very curious and intrigued about is, so a combination of the taverns and the casino. So obviously gambling is only legal within a, a variety of states. Um, 
in Nevada being being one of those. It's, it's obviously a massive um, gambling community, or I guess not massive community, but very popular <laughs> for that. Is it still kind of like a good old boys club? What it, what is the process of? I'd have to imagine there's some sort of level of having to be established and then working your way through not only the other individuals within the space, but politically, et cetera. Can you just kind of walk us through what, what the ecosystem is like, how you got involved with it, how you were able to scale it up to kind of where, what you did, any, any kind of intricacies that you could point out with that would be interesting. Yeah. I think, I think that, you know, the biggest thing is, is having now been in it for 25 years, there's this just incredible respect for the integrity of the system, the licensees and, and the gaming control board. I mean, look, there's no due process in, in gaming, meaning that, you know, if they want to take your license away tomorrow. They can, if they want to come to your home and, and look in your safe or go, you know, talk to your eighth grade teacher, or go to your safety deposit box. They have the full discretion to do that. Break your kneecaps. If you do something wrong, uh, not so much, break your kneecaps, <laughs> but, 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 you know, they, the gaming control board, they don't lower the bar for anybody. And it's, it's incumbent upon you to conduct yourself with a certain business probity where you really do think and act differently. And I don't, I don't say that to impress you, but impress upon you that as a gaming licensee, you know, if there's a certain business probity uh, and and certain associations that you just you you don't do certain things and you do do certain things based off the foundation of that you're a licensee and it just kind of morphs you that way. But you know, I stumbled into it by accident when I made this passive investment and I got introduced, you know, because I wanted to go out on my own. It was the lure of slot machines, but I didn't even understand what I didn't understand. And you know, there's two types of licenses in Las Vegas. There's a restrictive license and an unrestrictive license. A restrictive license is 15 machine, machines or less, and the taxes of those machines are set by the state. And an unrestrictive license is 16 machines or more, and it's a percentage of revenue. And the way the state looks at a licensee is that you are, you're, you're essentially like a, um, a collection agency of taxes for the state. So they put a lot of uh, emphasis in the integrity of who their licensees are. And yeah, there is, uh, it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's a, uh, an old uh, boys club because there's some fabulous women that are both licensees as, and, and, and principals and, and what have you. But it is this kind of network of folks. It's not a, it's not a huge number. There's not a lot of uh, non-restrictive licensees. There's more restrictive licensees, but even in that realm, it's um, it's a limited number of folks, and yeah, it's it's a it's a fascinating industry. You know, a slot machine never gets turned off. It, it operates twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. Um, I, I I I think it's a great asset class to have in one's portfolio. Uh, someone you should always have some sort of a slot machine. But, but yeah, it's, you know, look, the industry, classic, classic portfolio dynamics, <laughs> exactly. So, you know, it's diversification, but you know, it's yeah. changed right over the last 25 years, you can, you know, when I first got in there, were not, there were a lot of, uh, smaller folks, individuals that owned, you know, hotel casinos. Now, if you look present day, you've got, you know, the bifurcation of operations in real estate where you've got massive funds coming in like BlackRock or different people buying the real estate and the casino companies are, leasing and then you've got big casino companies you know whether it be the sands or the win or or mgm um these are multi-billion dollar corporations and so kind of the old school individual owners that own the hotel casinos they're down vote they're down to a couple handfuls of them so has that been within the last what would you say for a number of years that it's gotten more institutional is that it, it's been it's you know it's been a, it's been a gradual progression because okay. As you know, generations change or or valuations change. You know, there's been different. There's been a different event. So you had a you had a shift in 08, 09 of debt and equity, and a lot of companies, you know, got repositioned or you know, people lost assets, new people came in, just completely different new capitalizations. And then you had you know other opportunities where you know people sold or you know they went into the public markets and they took you know, private assets and went into the public market. So it's been over the last, shall we say, couple of decades that it's happened. But, you know, be that as it may, you could still come to Vegas and I could tour you and still show you, you know, a half dozen hotel casino projects 
that are still owned by individual folks. And, and there's a whole slew of big, big restricted operations that are, that are owned by individual folks. Because once you own three restricted locations, you then get investigated as if you're a non-restrictive licensee. And it's called an ex- expanded review on a restrictive license. And the investigation process is, is much more uh, in-depth, shall we say. And lastly, I will tell you that it's probably one of the great things you can do for the soul is to go through a licensing from the Nevada Gaming Control Board. There's nothing like it. And it's the most intrusive, comprehensive doctor's appointments for months upon months upon months of everything associated in your life that, uh, so, yeah. Yeah. A nice, a nice rectal screening, perhaps. I was saying that colonoscopy. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's all those things plus plus. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and Andrew, how many locations are you running to date or today? Uh, currently we've got, uh, seven active locations that we operate 300, you know, plus or minus 300 employees over the course of doing the taverns. I think we've done 25 to 30 of them, you know, mm-hmm. bought some, sold some, um, 0809 affected us no different than anybody else. But currently today we operate, um, seven and gotcha. we have another location that we lease out for the real estate. Cool. Okay. Uh, that's interesting. A, a, a slight change in direction. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about the the late great Tony Shea. Can you give the listeners a few highlights of your experience with him? Dan, yes. Difficult subject for me. Sure. Right. Naturally. Yeah. You know, Tony was uh, one of a kind, and and even though you know that it sounds a little bit cliche because we're all one of a kind, you don't come across a thinker like Tony that often in your life. It's, you know, I put him into the worlds of the, the Steve Jobs, those kind of folks, really an incredible individual, had a mind that was just fascinating. It was one of the great periods of my life, business-wise, that I got to be a part of. And where, if you said to me, what's the greatest thing that, you know, that Tony did, Tony had this unique ability to put people together in serendipitous sort of kind of both purposeful, but also serendipitously these interactions to where great things could happen. And so he was just really great at being a conductor of this human orchestra and that orchestra played it played business, it played social, it played all over the place. And he was just this fabulous conductor. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds, I mean, very balanced. I've, I've, I've heard a few stories as well too. And it's, he just seems like, he seemed like an amazing person. So it's great that you were able to have that relationship with him. Andrew, one last question before we hop over to Mike, Mike, sorry to to neglect you for the last few minutes. I swear we want to get to your story. Andrew, can you, You've done a ton of different transactions. Are there a few notable ones that that have a good story? What I guess what would be what the top one or the two most notable list. transactions? Yeah, exactly. Well, I think pro- probably the pinnacle. It's not every day you get to buy City Hall of Las Vegas. So that I mean that was you know an incredible transaction. Of, you know, you sign City Hall of Las Vegas, you get one of the great companies in the world, Amazon, to guarantee the credit and put you know tens upon tens of millions of dollars into an asset that you own. Um, so that would be number one. Number two, I think equally in a different way is not very often you get to buy a hotel casino in Las Vegas, Nevada. So the fact that I got to, as an individual, buy a hotel casino, lead a hotel casino, I think that it, that's pretty special as well. And then the third is I'm, I'm, I, I like all the various deals that we did along the way. And when I say we, every deal has, you know, I get the credit maybe, but there's a lot of people that are, that are the part of the process. And, you know, it, it does take a team and yes, there's always a quarterback, but just like in team sports, you know, everyone's got a role and, and the roles are very important in order to execute appropriately. And so all the deals in between, whether it be the life is beautiful festival that we did whether it be building a, a tavern organization that we did, whether it be 
you know, arbitraging 1500 apartments, or now whether it be building apartments with, you know, Arter and Michael, it just, all of them kind of take on their own kind of special flair. But the two I gave you, if you said to me the great highlight, I would say those two. And then maybe, maybe the third biggest highlight would be just the totality of everything that Tony Shane and we all did together at Downtown Project. That's hell of a resume. Okay, now to uh, future highlights. Mikey, you're up. <laughs> Give the listeners a, a quick background and bio. What's, what's going on with you? You're not really setting me up for success going after Donner. <laughs> that's, where, that's where legends are made, is, is following the, the main act. So my background, I mean, I'll start. So I graduated 2015 from college, mechanical engineering. When I was in school, um, I actually interned at one of the larger mechanical subcontractors in the Bay Area, Critchfield Mechanical, and interned for my last two summers of school. And really while I was in college, I mean, I, Andrew would say when he was younger, he had you know, paper out, was always, always interested in doing something to make an extra buck. And I, I really came to find that out about myself in college. You know, I, I saw that I was extremely motivated, ambitious, and thoroughly enjoyed kind of working for myself. So I, you know, I was pursuing this engineering degree and um, Andrew can probably attest to me bugging him like as I was halfway through this degree, like, I don't know what I'm doing getting an engineering degree, you know, and, and the, and the guidance was stick with it. It's a great degree I and mean, you can build off of it. So I did. And if you don't realize anything I've done in business has probably been, at least been talked about or ran through Andrew. So it, it, it starting then. So I, it was, it was basically a discussion of, do I switch my major? Decided not to. And I ended up getting a job at that company that I interned at, CMI, Critchfield Mechanical. I started as a project engineer, did that for a year and a half. So basically 2015 to the end of 2016, halfway through 2016, um, I started searching for a pivot in and out. And uh, I was bugging my uncle a lot. And I was like, I, I don't. At least I know what I don't want to do, but I don't know what I want to do. And I just started poking around. And thanks to Andrew's Rolodex, he basically was like, have you ever heard of real estate development? And I was like, I, no, but uh, willing to talk about it. And this is actually pretty, this is a good story. So Andrew did a transaction with the Wolf Company in downtown Las Vegas when he was partners with Tony, about 220 units, uh, mid-rise. And through that, he had a good relationship with Tim Wolf. So the Wolf Company is run by two brother, three brothers, sorry. And so basically I was introduced to Tim and you know, he deferred me over to the development team at Wolf and they have an incredible interview process. So it started with a baseline case study, which is basically like a test of your Excel skills. And I had none. And so Andrew through, you know, he talked about selling the Lady Luck Hotel Casino to CIM out of LA. And through that, um, Scott Stafford, who Andrew, was he a managing director? Uh, uh, he was a, he was a, yeah, but he, had, but he, his company was Strata. Strata, right. But when he was, you met him at CIM. He was a director. <clears throat> so he was a director at CIM and uh, branched off, started up his own private equity company with two other partners. I think one of his partners was the former mayor of San Francisco. Anyways. He, well, he, no, no. He was a former uh, may, uh, uh, advisor to the mayor and then also uh, uh, the city attorney of San Francisco. But go okay. ahead. There it is. And yeah, so Strata, S-T-R-A-D-A, their corporate headquarters is downtown San Francisco. But basically I had this case that I had no idea what to do with it. And Andrew was like, you know, going through his Rolodex, like, hey, I called my buddy Scott. And this was right around the holidays. This was like November. 
And I remember Andrew was like, you're going to go down there. You're going to bring them three pies, a couple bottles of wine, and you're going to introduce yourself and you're going to tell them what you're doing and you're going to get help on this case study. But I had no idea how to do. And um, and so I did that. And I, I don't know if it was one of Scott's associates and like an analyst that he had. They held my hand and then some basically did this case study for me. And I turned it in, I probably got like a 70, 60, 70% on it. And then they're like, okay, great. Yeah, you did well enough to get the baseline case study now. I was like, awesome, can't wait. And so the baseline case study ended up just being, you had to create this whole model from scratch. And I went back to Scott. I think I combined it. I think I brought him pies. And then when I went back the second time, I bought him some wine. <laughs> and basically, same, same, same deal. Went back to him again. They did this baseline case study for me. And um, the joke, I, I never remember, it was about a year ago before I left Tim. We were having a late dinner and drinks. He's like, you know that to this day, you're the only one that's totally failed the case study and still got hired. So pr pretty funny. But I basically... I got, I did okay enough on the case study to get a trip to Scottsdale, sat down, got to meet Tim in person, convinced him to give me a chance. They made up a, they, I think they made up a position for me, junior analyst at the time. They had never done that. Um, Michael's, what Michael's not telling you is that the principal called me and said, what do I do with your nephew? But <laughs> that's another story. You didn't, you didn't tell me that. You, I know that's, that a true, that. that's a true story. You pulled a lot of strings to get me in that door. You're worth it. And so I, I, I remember looking Tim in the face. I'm like, look, I know that I don't know anything, but I want to learn. I will be the first one in here, the last one out here. I'll do whatever it takes, please. But to the ex certain extent, I said something like that. And I was at the Wolf Company from January 2017 um, till the end of 2019. About three years. By the time I left, I was an associate. I, I was basically out sourcing my own deals. And at that time, Tim Wolf, who was running the development team, decided to kind of step away and with a partner created this little boutique industrial shop. He, I was his first call and I went with him over the course of just under two years. We went from you know Tim and his partner and myself to a team of 10. I think they did just over a hundred million dollars of production last year. And that's, that experience was what, that's what really allowed me to kind of take a leap of faith and step away. You know, Wolf's this massive company. It's got dozens and dozens of employees and it's siloed, but seeing, you know, basically being with two partners, starting with just one little industrial deal and, building out that platform and everything that basically in, is involved in that process. That's what allowed me to kind of take, take a step away and a leap of faith from Tim and kind of go out on my own. And, and um, so what is it? It's June 10th. Now I left Tim July of last year. So it's been, been 11 months of me running around with my head cut off and uh, well, Andrew's been holding my hand. So. <laughs> well, I'm sure what Andrew will probably tell you is you'll probably spend the rest of, the rest of your life feeling like your head's cut off, but with some direction. Yeah. Um, <laughs> a quick little anecdote for the listeners, Mikey, I don't know if you remember, but when you were working at the Wolf Company, you came in and gave a presentation to me and my family to invest. And I don't know if... Uh, this this is the same for you, Andrew, but the whole presentation basically consisted of Mike and his partner telling us that, oh yeah, we, we raised all these funds. None of them are open, by the way, so you can't invest in us, but uh, yeah, this is what we do. So <laughs> I was like, wait, what? What just happened here? Uh, so yeah, the Wolf Company was doing pretty well, and uh, you obviously continued that trend through your next venture. And now, I think I just got a capital call email from both of you. So I'm looking forward to an even bigger success with the Ardor company. And uh, I guess that's a good segue for 
Chris to go into some of our next questions. Yeah, Mike, can you give us a little bit of context of, you know, kind of what you guys are doing and maybe some of the eventual goals, not necessarily specifics of what you're looking for in a deal, but just kind of break down the company and what you guys are doing. Yeah. So when I stepped away from Tim, candidly, I didn't even have a well thought out business plan. Um, I stepped away and I was like, I'm going to figure out something that makes sense to me and I'm going to kind of run with it. And where I landed on was multifamily real estate, specifically in Vegas. You know, at the time it was different market conditions, you know, but new Vegas, know the market well. And, you know, politically and just individuals that you kind of need to reach out to, to get deal flow. I kind of already had that. So it, it, it was a good market to focus on. And then for multifamily, you know, Vegas is a, is a growing market. We can we talk about that more, but that's how I kind of landed on multifamily in Vegas and specifically development. As you guys are aware, I mean, dating back to a year ago, going out, you know, value add is such a broad term, but going out to buy an asset, a stabilized multifamily complex. I mean, even a year ago, I was like, this is just crazy what these prices are. But if you look at development, there's still a spread there, right? Where you could kind of build to, you know, a five and a half, six percent yield, and you were seeing stabilized assets sell for kind of a low four cap. So that spread to me just intuitively made sense. We should be focused on ground up development. So since then, um, as, as Eric mentioned, we have our first deal now. We're just going out for, well, we had our capital call this week. And we're set to close early July. It's a hundred unit deal. This, let's see, we got it. I got it under contract, Andrew and I did in December. And this was a rezone with the city of North Las Vegas. So basically, Andrew and I got it into escrow. We took it through the approval process with the city. At that time, well, a little before we got full approvals, we started to go out and make some calls um, because at the end of the day, you know, it's just Andrew and I, and we have a certain skill set. but when it comes to designing a whole set of plans and being construction managers, we knew that, you know, we, there's only so much we can do. So we did go out in kind of January and February and found a great partner, Forum Investment Group out of Denver. Yeah, so this first deal, it's fully approved. We basically have our full, DD set of design next week. And we're, yeah, we're set to close in, in early July. And on top of that, we have two other transactions that are in escrow in different parts of the town. One's in Clark County, one's in Henderson. So yeah, I've got a, got a few things going on. Congratulations. We're excited. This question's for either you, Andrew, or you, Mike. Uh, I, what I'm curious about is clearly Andrew's knee deep in Vegas. That's what he knows. Um, and I'm sure he has a, a strong pull for you to start developing there, but in comparison to, let's say the Phoenix market, w what's your view right now? Cause we're in Phoenix, Chris and I, I've been watching the market. I am an outsider, so I don't see the intricacies, but how would you compare the two markets today? Both desert markets. How do they look from your perspectives? I mean, a tackle you want to tackle. Dual. Why don't you start and I'll turn in? Yeah, I mean, look, real estate's real estate, you know, and 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 we're market. I think we're agnostic to the market, but you got to know what you're great at, and you got to know what you're not great at. What I find is that if if you start to, you know, get don't laser in and focus, and you start to like open up the the become too broad, you can do a lot of stuff fair as opposed to a, a smaller amount of stuff great. And what we want to do is be great. You know, I would have answered the last question completely different than how Michael answered it. If you would have said to me, you know, what's Arter going to do? We're going to make our partners a lot of money and we're going to make a lot of money along the way. And we're going to have a heck of a lot of fun. And that's the goal, right? And we want to protect our downside. And, and so why Vegas? Well, Vegas, because number one, we know it well. Number two, there's a need. Number three, you know, love the tax climate, love the business climate. And there's just a lot of things we can do there. That doesn't mean that if there's not a compelling transaction in Phoenix or a compelling transaction in Idaho or a compelling transaction in Utah, that we would not look at that. 
I mean, there's plenty of, of times in, in my 30 years where I've been doing transactions in multiple states. But we have a robust pipeline. We see a pretty good road for the foreseeable future in Las Vegas. And so then we say to ourselves, why? Unless something is, oh my gosh, in the Phoenix market, and I'm only using Phoenix because that's what you put there, it would, have to, it would have to derail us to say, hey, let's shift focus for a moment in time here, or let's add and, and start doing Phoenix. Look, there will be a time where there's multiple states happening at one time, but for right now, there's a lot of great stuff that can be done in the Vegas marketplace. And I think we're going into an interesting business cycle, right? A lot of people would say we're going into choppy waters. How choppy they'll be, I don't know. But the choppier they are creates even more opportunity. That's that. No, that's perfect because that actually leads me into my next question about obviously nobody has a crystal ball, but we look at interest rates. Obviously, CPI just came out uh, today or yesterday, whatever it was. We're back up to 8.6% inflation. It went from 86 to I think 8.2 or 8.3, whatever it was. Now it's back up to 8.6. So this idea of inflation was starting to go down is maybe not necessarily there. Um, looking at, at interest rates, uh, would it, any concern there, the upcoming recession? I mean, how are you guys... Um, you know, how are you positioning yourself to, you know, weather the storm with interest rates? You know, look, you could argue we're in a recession now, right? And you and, and there's no question interest rates are going higher. You know, there's a lot of things we don't know, but here are the things we do know. What we do know is, is that there's things going on in the world that are just complicated. You got a war going on with Ukraine, both just on the surface of the inhumane stuff going on, but you've got, a, you know, you've got food challenges. You've got energy challenges as a result of that. You had lockdowns going on again because of COVID over in, you know, in what Shanghai and China area. Okay. So that, that creates challenges again, in regards to supply. So the, you know, the whole, look, if it was just normal business cycle, okay. You get inflation at times, rates go up, go down, we've got a recession, et cetera. But there's all these other third party influences that are going on that make it really complicated. The, the other part of the situation is, is that for a moment in time, all of us, doesn't matter what our age is, doesn't matter that I'm in my 50s and I don't, I, I presume that you gentlemen are in your 30s, okay? Or, or late 20s. Oh, easy now. I know I'm receding. I got, I've got some grays coming out. I'm holding on to 29 as long as I can. Okay. Well, I said late 20s. But <laughs> yeah. look, we, we all live through something that's insane. We live through a pandemic. Think, I just want everyone to rewind for a second and go back two years. If I would have said to you in January of 2020, the entire world shutting down. Now, and I mean that the entire world shutting down. You're going to be in your homes. No one like you're not going out. The world shutting down and this is going to go on. You'd look at me like I was delusional. OK, so we we experienced one of these incredible milestones that May never happen again, may happen again, don't know, but we experienced it. Part and parcel of that, we had more money given by a government all over the world, right? That's just insane. So what's happened is, is a lot of these personal households have savings. Those savings are theoretically getting eaten up. And once those get eaten up and debt starts getting taken, um, you're going to start to see kind of a shift in supply and demand. You're already starting to see, like if you just go into just basics, go to the used car market. Six months ago, you can't find a used car anywhere. The prices are escalating incredibly. Today, eh, it's not so robust. You know, people are like, eh, I don't know if I need that car or I don't want to buy that car. Look at gas prices. You know, I don't know if I need to take that trip. I don't know if I need to, you know, don't want to really drive my car as much. So, I mean, you're starting already to see consumer behavior happening. And so, you know, not to get too off point, but yeah, I mean, we, we can't predict what's going to happen. Do I think it's going to be choppy? Sure. Um, will it eventually get corrected? Probably what happens is the Fed, if, if, if I'm a guessing man, the Fed probably starts to raise even more aggressively. They've got to get, but it's possible they can't control inflation. Inflation, they can only... I think that the inflation only gets controlled by demand. Once the individual is just 
either doesn't have the money or shit's too expensive or they're feeling lousy enough where they're like, I'm just not doing it. I'm not, I'm not going on the trip, I'm not buying the car. I'm not doing this. That's when prices will start to come down because the demand has fallen off. They'll start to have to reduce prices and it'll start to come down. And I think you may actually see interest rate reductions again in 24 and 25 because they're going to have to go up pretty high over the next call it year. But you know, what's never going to change people's need to live somewhere and preferably a class A apartment in Las Vegas. And that's why the Ardor Company is going to be successful. Oh yeah, this podcast is brought to you by the Ardor Company. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. But yeah, that, that's a great explanation. I think you're, you hit the nail right on the head. Uh, you can't predict it, but all you can do is protect your downside, like you said before, and do what you've always done and do what you're good at. So I like that approach. You know, and you um, guys in, in 08, you were, you know, think about your age for a moment. You, you could experience one of the great, it, it'll be an interesting downturn. It's going to be, I yeah. think it's going to be fascinating for all of us what the next two years hold. Yep. I agree. Yeah. A lot of money to be made on uh, the, the ride up. So we'll see where the bottom reaches, but hopefully, hopefully it comes soon. <laughs> I've got to check in on my powder because my my dry powder is uh it seems to be <laughs> yeah. just blowing away at the moment. So yeah, <laughs> Eric, you said you've got another one before I hop into to my question. Yeah, uh, the last question I have for you guys with the Arter Company, you, you kind of touched on it already, but is there a a game plan long term? You know, way down the road, is there a, a a vision of what you want this to become? Is there a dollar amount that you want to have? under management? How, how do you view that in terms of your planning? So I, I can take that. Andrew, I poke holes in this, but what I envision is, Andrew already said this, doing really, really good deals, especially important in this time right now. And we're looking for deals that have a really good land basis. Um, and like Andrew said, ultimately have fun and make a lot of money for our partners. But what we really envision this, I think for this platform is, you know, eventually scaling it up to where we're ultimately self-sufficient developers. We don't need a co-developer as a partner. Do I envision this being 150 employees like the Wolf Company? Maybe not, but I think having, you know, a family office with 10 to 15 employees where we kind of have construction management covered, we have a couple of other Moriarty's running around where I can focus on high level partner interface, actually finding deals. But ultimately it would be great to have a platform where we can soup the nuts, do every part of the development process and establish success in our home market in Vegas. And then, you know, from there, when it makes sense, we can expand. And the, and the last part of that is, is that look, when you're taking third party capital, it's way more important than your own money. So there's no, there's not, there's not any one tra transaction that we would do that we have to do. We're in a great position where we don't have to do anything. And we have this incredible responsibility in, in friends and family or third party capital going into deals. Take that very seriously because personally in my career, I've never lost anyone, any money in, a, in any transactions. And so I take that, so that, that's something that's very sensitive. And, you know, look, I want this to be, I'm here to support Michael and whatever, wherever Michael wants to go and whatever Michael wants it to be is where I want to take it. And I, and I, you know, when Michael, I just listened to Michael kind of articulate of where he'd like the company to be. And I'll say it in a little bit of a different way. And that is, is that, you know, it's kind of like we all played the game. We've all played the game Monopoly and, in a, in a way, this is like real life monopoly and it's fun. And well, so, so some of us have played, some of us have dominated. I'll, I'll just, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's, 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 it's fun. And there's just, there's just no reason to ever stop. And I believe, you know, what the, the final stopping of, of playing the game of monopoly will be is when, you know, I have to lie down for that final nap in in my wooden bed. So my uh, my best monopoly story is a, is a few Section Eight fourplexes that I, I ended up flipping, but I don't think that's going to get anywhere <laughs> near the uh, the city hall of of uh, the town yeah. hall of of, uh, of Vegas. 
Oh, uh, is that Baltic, never, Baltic you, never know where, you never know where it can go. <laughs> Section eight flipping is fantastic. Yeah. Exactly. So, all right. Um, I want you guys to put your school teacher hat on for one, one last question. And let's try to dumb this down as much as possible. So the majority of our listeners are going to have real estate experience. They're probably going to know a lot of the buzzwords that you guys are saying. There's probably going to be a section of them that don't. And when I think of an average person, I don't think an average person hears a hundred million dollar deal and thinks that's small. That's, that's a massive ordeal. So in the most elementary dumbed down way, can you walk us through three minute version of a hundred million dollar deal? You know, Getting entitled, getting it into escrow, entitlements, doing a capital raise. What does the distribution look like? Actually paying back your investors, et cetera. I, I feel like a lot of people will, will be intrigued of as big and crazy as this sounds. You know how how feasible it is. It's not easy. I'm not saying yeah, it's yeah. easy. Let me take let me take part of it, and then I'll have Michael take part of it. So, because I want to make it, I want to. I, I wouldn't say I want to dumb it down. I want to simplify it. Right. Okay. Perfect. Right. Okay. So let's take a hundred million. You want to use a hundred million dollar deal? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So on any transaction, you need to have a portion of the, uh, and let's use a, the, the pot as a hundred million. You have to have a portion of debt and you have to have a portion of equity. And depending on the project, the question becomes, what's the proper balance between debt and equity? And obviously the more equity you put into a project, the safer it is, right? You got it. And then you have to understand what is the kind of debt? And what I mean by the kind of debt, what's the term of the debt? How long is the debt? The rate of the debt? Is it a, is it, do you have to guarantee the debt? If you do have to guarantee the debt, what type of guarantee are you guaranteeing? And what type of guarantee are you issuing of that guarantee? So there's those types of things. So, but it, to keep it simple, on a $100 million deal, it, it becomes, what is the asset? Is it, a, is it an apartment asset that we're talking about? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's, talk, let's, let's stick talk with about multifamily. Apartment. Okay. So on an apartment complex of a $100 million deal, you're going to put in somewhere between 30 and 40% of equity. So you need 30 to $40 million and you need 70 to 60 to $70 million of debt. The way you're going to get the 30 to $40 million is you're going to go to a big capital partner that has the ability to put in a majority of that 30 or 40 million. Certainly you can run around and raise, you know, you're running around and raising the 30 or 40 million, but where we would go is we would go to more of an institutional shop to put in that money of that, call it 90% or 85% or 95% of that 30 or $40 million. And so let's use the 40 million and let's assume a firm's going to put in 90% of that $40 million. So they're going to put in $36 million and that's going to be, um, a limited partnership of, of money that gets put into a transaction. And then there's an additional piece of $4 million that needs to get put in. That's typically by the developer. Now, this limited partner that put in the $36 million, they may be a partner with you. They may not. But let's assume that's a check that Michael and I put in into it. And maybe we put that in of our own money, or maybe we put that in of friends and family's money. But $40 million goes into the pot. Then there's a loan of the 60 million and that 60 million uh, gets signed on by somebody uh, of a construction loan, right? And there's trying to just keep this simple. There's all kinds of different types of construction loans and there's the capitalization of the transaction, right? Before any of this happened, a piece of property was found, a piece of property was entitled, a piece of property was put into escrow, just like you would if you were buying a, a home. You know, there's time to do diligence on it. So you're doing all of your different investigations. And while you're doing all of these in dis investigations on the property that you're buying is you're putting together this hundred million dollars and you're getting all your contracts for construction and your contracts for architecture and your contracts, all your various different folks, away you go and you build your project. I'll let Michael, I want, you can take through once we've built the project distributions and different things if you want. Yeah. So basically, say you, you know, you're going through construction, it takes two to three years to build it, to stabilize it. When I say stabilize it, actually getting renters in that lease up a unit, um, you know, Depending on what you define stabilization as, we usually say 95% occupied. 
So once the complex is 95% occupied, then we'll go out. And like Andrew said, there's different types of construction loans. What we typically do and what we will do on our first project is an interest only construction loan. And it matures after a certain period, say three years. So we build it and stabilize it in two, two and a half years. As soon as it's stabilized, we would go out and then get permanent debt. When I say permanent debt, you can think of think of a typical mortgage on a home. That's what I mean by permanent debt. Um, and maybe there's an interest only period, maybe not, but we basically would then, you know, at, at that point, when you have a stabilized asset, the value is a lot more than when you just had a piece of land you were starting construction on. So you basically get that loan, pay off your construction loan. And then if there's any excess beyond that, um, which, you know, we, we obviously pro forma that there will be, that goes out via partner distributions. And from there, you have a cash flowing asset that, you know, your renters are paying and you have your expenses, you have your debt service, and then anything below that is distributable cash flow until up until you either get another, you know, in a handful of years, maybe you go and refinance it again or you sell it. But that it's basically that process. Easy peasy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so as a developer, I always say it's kind of like a, you kind of have to be a jack of all trades. I mean, it's like they're, you have to put on a legal hat. You have to, you know, put on a construction hat, finance. I mean, there's just like all these different aspects. That's why I love it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it may sound complex, but it's a process and it's not rocket science. All right. Last but not least, this show is called Mind the Growth. The whole purpose is uh, we like to talk about personal and professional growth and development. So our last question for both of you, and we'll start on you, Mike, since you were the last to, to talk. What does the word growth mean to you? Growth. I, I think it can, to me, I think growth means, you know, personally, professionally, you know, I'm, I'm always trying to grow in both of those aspects. Personally, I have a fiance and a dog. That's basically our kid at this point. Um, he's in the ass. But, uh, you know, over the past year and a half that I've had Haley in my life, that's that's been the, the growth that I'm most proud about. I think because of that, and I, I give her a, a lot of credit to this, you know, I, I've had some good professional growth as well. So to me, it's, you know, it's a balance, but I think that my professional growth has stemmed a lot from my personal growth. So that's kind of my two cent takeaway on it. Andrew will have a much more intricate answer than me. <laughs> Same question for you, Andrew. Can you repeat the question? What does the word growth mean to you? First thing that comes to mind. Well, it could be, it could be height, right? But, <laughs> that's a great yeah. answer. It's right. the first time we've heard that answer. So that might be a and good, that's, unique that's one. A, yeah. I, you know, it, to me, the education process is never ending. And if you just kind of look that everyone and everything around you is a opportunity to learn, it could be the landscape at your, your house, you know, putting the soil in of the flowers that I don't know anything about. And it could be the cleaning lady, you know, cleaning your floors in a certain way. And yet it could be a phenomenal lecture or a great podcast. And so if you just kind of embrace the concept of all of these things are opportunities and you practice humility and you practice that you're always willing to learn and that anyone at any time can teach you and you, and that you want to learn, then the possibilities are endless. Love it. Great way to think about it. Well, I could, well, we'll have to uh, we'll have to continue the conversation at Andrew's place over a glass of tequila at some point. That's the <laughs> only way I'll continue the conversation. <laughs> Perfect. You don't and you're to... cordially invited. You have you are invited anytime to come by the fire pit and sip on tequila. I'll provide both. <laughs> Much appreciated. Oh. Okay. Well, thanks you again don't have for to twist my arm for that. 
<laughs> exactly. All right. Well, signing off. Thanks again, guys. Sorry for all the technical difficulties. Thanks, guys. 